Good evening, everyone. You know, when looking up the definition of entrepreneurship, I saw that it was defined as the risk taker in a business. And you see, that has honestly been the model of my life. I mean, you name it, I was willing to take a risk on it to see if it would become profitable. I remember when I was in school, I started an organization, a candy business, right, because every entrepreneur starts in school. And I called it the helping hands of BEG, where I told students that you are helping to provide financial assistance to a child in need. Until one day, one kid asked me, and he got smart. He said, um, uh, what does BEG actually stand for? And I was forced to tell him, Brandon Elijah Gibson. You see, you are the helping hands that financially assist me. But that later led me, and that passion that I had led me to starting another business where I would purchase clothes, shoes, apparel, you name it. I, oh, geez. I would purchase it online. Um, from overseas and imported it into the country. Why? In the hopes of selling it to make a profit. You see, an entrepreneur was just who I was and what I would become. Someone who always saw that potential inside of me was my mother and said that I will become her billion dollar son. You know why she said that? Honestly, I think it's because I'm her favorite. She's actually in the audience, so we can ask her afterwards. But you see, that potential that she saw and that I had inside of me later led me into starting a pressure cleaning business by the name of Pristine Pressure Cleaning, where I would go to homeowners and I would ask if I could pressure clean their decks. You see, at the time, I lived in Virginia, and I don't know if anybody's ever lived up north. The heat is terrible. I mean, it's, 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 it's terrible is the best words I can put it. And so what that does is it causes um, the decks of homeowners to deteriorate, you know, and so what pressure cleaning does is it provides the opportunity to help revitalize those homeowners' decks. So I had identified the problem, you know, the deterioration, destruction of homeowners' decks. I found my target audience, neighbors in my neighborhood, and I had identified the solution, pressure cleaning. In my eyes, I had created the foolproof business model, where my goal in the 10th grade of driving to school in a Lamborghini, right? That's everybody's goal in the 10th grade, will come to fruition. What was the reality? I can tell you it wasn't that I had a Lamborghini in the 10th grade. You know, I realized that I went into the business solely believing the idea that if I could get enough funding from my investors, <clears throat> my parents, <laughs> that I could grow the business to doing $100,000 a year. Now, it's funny when I think about it, and you guys can laugh at that too, because I almost thought it was possible. But what I realized is it was for three main reasons. One. I was 15, and my parents were not going to let me drop out of school to start any pressure cleaning business. Two, my investors, aka those parents that I mentioned, were going to take most of that money anyway. And three, which took me the longest time to realize, is that I was driven mainly by the thought of how much money I could make and not by providing an intrinsic value or purpose to my customers. And you see, I accredit the failures of so many businesses, whether startups or established to the false perception centered around entrepreneurship. You know, these entrepreneurs believe that if they can right, bring in as much money into their business, that can be used what fuels, and fuels the business and grows. You know, you have to ask, why do they think like that? Because entrepreneurs have expenses. They have to pay themselves. They have to pay employees. They have operational costs. They have investors. Me, I had investors and more investors to pay. But at the same time, these same entrepreneurs forget the transformational ideas and services that their business was built off of, right? That purpose, before the thought of money even came into the picture. And so in my eyes, I believe it creates an indefinite cut in a business. And we, in the last speaker, he talked about spinal surgery, and I believe you know, that can be applied to entrepreneurship. You know, businesses create a cut in the business that leaves the business vulnerable and susceptible for additional problems to enter the business. And in the story of pristine pressure cleaning and in the story of so many businesses, that cut becomes an open wound. And what does it do? It causes problems, right? And so I came up with the idea, you know, that I had to figure out where did these perceptions come from? And how as entrepreneurs can we overcome these perceptions, right? Because of profit versus purpose. And inherently, I believe these perceptions come from when we establish our businesses. You see, it's simple. We establish it as either being a for-profit or a non-for-profit. What's the goal of a for-profit business? 
to make money. What's the goal of a non-for-profit? To serve society and help society in some way without the initial goal of making money. You know, but just because we establish for-profit businesses, it does not permit the business to lose its purpose in the process. You see, purpose is universal and is there not to just help the financial pockets of the business, but is there to help the employees and more importantly, there to help the customers, the bottom line. And so, and to paint a scenario of two businesses that we are very, very familiar with, you know, one that ha has prospered because of being purpose-led, while the other has disappeared because of being profit-driven, is a business by the name of Circuit City. You see, Circuit City was at one point the largest electronic retailer in the entire country. And this was not just for a few years. This was nearly for three decades, in the 70s, in the 80s, and leading into part of the 90s. But over time, the company began to realign itself about how profitable it was. And they thought it was plausible to let go of its most experienced sales personnel, coupled with opening a spree of new locations. Now, I'm no genius, but that was the perfect storm for a disaster. Money that you already don't have is going to be used to open locations, but money, once again, that you do not have. You see, in the words of Alan Wartzel, who was the previous CEO of the company, he said it was not apparent in sales and revenue, but the rot had set in the company. And in a study done in 2003 by Jennifer Watson from Forbes, she said that Best Buy, who was now emerging into the market and had overtaken the market share that Circuit City was once owned, was doing about $28 million per location. You know how much Circuit City was doing? About 15 million. Nearly half that of Best Buy. In the words of another CEO, he said it was once about what excited the customers. Then it became about what excited Wall Street. You see, the continual overlap of bad decision making later led to the demise of this great business. And in November of 2008, Circuit City filed for bankruptcy. But let's shift the mood. Let's, let's paint a little brighter picture. You know, a business that we all love, well, let me speak for myself, a business that I love, but I hate when Sunday comes because that's inherently when I always want them the most, is a business by the name of Chick-fil-A. You see, Chick-fil-A was established around the same time period as Circuit City, but has prospered because of being purpose-driven. And in the 70s, they had tremendous and rapid growth. But in 1982, it became the year known as the defining moment for this great business, right? Because of new competition emerging into the market that threatened their preeminent product, that chicken sandwich, you know, that sounds we all like, was now ha had new competition. And you couple that with now opening more locations because they were growing so much, their revenue began to drop. Story sounds very familiar, right? But what happened? Corporate devised a meeting where three questions were asked. Why are we here? Why are we alive? And why are we in business? And after that, the corporate model was established for this business, with the latter part of it saying, to be a positive influence to everyone that we come in contact with. And in a study done in 2014, it says that per Chick-fil-A, it does about $3.1 million per store. Now that leaves the entire fast food industry by a, a huge margin. You know, a competitor that we all know by the name of McDonald's does about 2.5 million, right? And that's not even the most ironic statistic. When this study was done, it was, it was said that, um, that Chick-fil-A had just under 2,000 locations, whereas McDonald's had nearly 14,000 and was open seven days a week. You see, Chick-fil-A is the model when you put people in control and you allow the values of the business to be the drivers of success, you prosper. And not just is, is it apparent in these two scenarios of profit versus purpose-driven business, but what do statistics show? You know, the studies show that 85% of businesses that were purpose-led saw an increase in revenue in a calendar year, whereas profit-driven business saw a decrease in revenue, actually 45% saw a decrease in revenue in a calendar year. And you ask, why is this? It's very simple. When employees know the purpose of the business, it creates an inviting atmosphere because they want to work at the place that they go to work to. And when customers enter into the business, they feel that atmosphere. 
And so what, does that, what effect does that have? It sees a revenue increase and more profitability for the company. And so I wanted to figure out you know, how powerful purpose was in general. And so I did an experiment of my own. You know, I asked my mom what may be seen as an eccentric question. I asked her, why did you have kids? This was the response I got to it. Really? <laughs> Foxy emoji with the mouth open. You know, I could hear her saying, really, Brandon? Why are you asking me this, huh? Why? I said, no, mom, like, really? Like, why did you have kids? And this was her response. The enjoyment of loving someone who would love me back. But the most important part was this last line, making a difference in their lives. And before you guys say all, because I know that's what you guys are thinking, <laughs> just as I am to my mother, so is the business to an entrepreneur. You see, entrepreneurs are fathers and mothers as well. And what is the job of a father and mother? To nurture the business so that it goes on to make a difference in the lives of the people they come in contact with, just like a child. And if we, are, and if we want to have sustainability within our businesses, then we must lead with purpose. Thank you.